Hello and welcome to Market Guru. I'm Anupra and I'm filling in for Vivek Law and joining me today on the show. Very special guest all the way from London, Philip Poole and he's Head of uh, Global and Macro Strategy at HSBC AMC. Philip, I have to begin with uh, something that you pointed out in your report as well. 2013, uh, what's it going to be like, risk on or off? 2012 was really almost a schizophrenic year uh, where you saw a year of two halves. What's 2013 looking like to you? I think the good news for 2013 is that the cycle in, in some key markets has turned in the United States and China. So uh, I think uh, that's supportive, uh, certainly. And I would say also the event risks that were so problematic for markets uh, uh, last year are also less of a, an issue this year, whether it's the Eurozone or U.S. fiscal cliff, for example. So I think from a global perspective, um, it's, it, it's a... It's a it's a good start to the year in that respect, an improved cycle, less event risk, and the valuations in many of the markets, particularly the equity markets, still look attractive. Philip, if I had to be a bit of a pessimistic, uh, uh, give a pessimistic view at this point, a lot of euphoria across all markets, be it the global emerging markets, be it the developed pact as well. Uh, a lot of people would, however, argue at this point, have the risks really receded or have you just swept them under the carpet, like the European Union, for example? We heard what Cameron had to say yesterday. We've heard a lot of commentary coming out from Mario Draghi as well. But no work has really been done. Um, has the global market just decided to forget about it for a while? Yeah, I think my, my view is that the Eurozone problem is a 10-year adjustment uh, problem. It's not, it's not over. But what the uh, ECB did uh, with the... OMT bond buying program was really provide a backstop which I think is extremely important. Uh, it reduces the risk, sub substantially reduces the risk of a, of a short-term Eurozone breakup. So the Eurozone issues are still there. These economies are struggling to grow, even Germany. Um, that's a problem obviously for debt to GDP ratios. Uh, some of them are still in recession, the likes of Italy and Spain. Uh, so it's still an issue, but it's less of a problem for market sentiment because I think the, the, the real concern that, that impacted the markets last year was uh, this idea that the Eurozone would break up and potentially uh, Greece uh, would exit before the end of the year. That didn't happen, and I think the, 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 the risk of it happening certainly uh, in 2013 is, is reduced again also by this uh, OMT program from the ECB. The other aspect is that um, the fiscal cliff, as it was called in the U.S., proved to be a problem in the fourth quarter for markets, at least for the first half of the fourth, qu uh, fourth quarter of last year anyway. Um, fiscal consolidation is still an issue for the United States. The debt ceiling uh, uh, discussions are ongoing, but we don't have the same kind of critical concern that the U.S. potentially gets thrown back into recession as a result of the fiscal cliff. Uh, and, and the very sharp tightening in, in, in uh, um, uh, policy that we would have had uh, as a result if we'd fallen over that cliff. So I think on both counts, uh, the, the, the event risks, while they're still there, are much reduced. As the risks recede, Philip, uh, as you're talking about the risk of recession has completely receded out of the U.S., one would now ask, what is the risk of recovery, especially given the fact uh, that Ben Bernanke has come out and, ahead and said that don't expect the QE tap to stay open all the time. Uh, we will recede back as the economy recovers. How much of a risk does the recovery in the U.S. pose uh, to the free money that we've got so comfortable with at this point? Well, what's happened uh, specifically with the Fed is that they've moved from this idea of calendar guidance. In other words, we will do this until a certain uh, date in the future to a really event or, or uh, um, uh, guidance that's based on certain outcomes. And the outcome that they focus mostly on, of course, uh, is unemployment. Now, the target they've set for themselves is 6.5%. Now, we're still close to 8% uh, unemployment rate in the United States, slightly below that. Uh, but the reality is, in my opinion anyway, we're not going to get anywhere close to 6.5% by the end of 2013. So I believe that um, despite the speculation that QE will end uh, uh, in 2013, I think that's very unlikely. I think we'll see continued QE at the current pace through the end of the year and then probably at a reduced pace into 2014. So it's something clearly to keep an eye on. 
but the reality is that there's a lot of excess capacity in the system. Uh, the, that unemployment rate's not going to come down uh, uh, particularly quickly. And I really don't see inflation picking up in the United States or, or Europe uh, sharply in 2013 either. So I think we're left with a situation where uh, rates uh, from key central banks remain uh, ultra low. The Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, the BOJ, interestingly, probably uh, further loosening policy in the course of the year after the change of governor uh, in April. So I think we're left with a very loose monetary environment in the developed world and that clearly will keep a lot of liquidity in the system and if risk appetite uh, uh, really is relatively firm that will be good uh, for risky assets. And where would this money flow to Philip? That would be the big question as the hot money continues to flow into these markets. Uh, what will be some of the hot destinations in 2012 where this money could flow to? If we sort of step back and look at value in a, in a longer term context, we, we think that uh, core government bonds, uh, whether that's in Europe or the United States or Japan, uh, these bonds look expensive on fundamentals. So uh, we don't see much value in those uh, treasury or gilt or bond markets. Um, and we see value actually in some of the spread products in the fixed income world, including in Asia and we see value in equity markets relative to bonds overall. So we believe actually that the, the time to buy assets is when they're cheap, not when they're expensive. Uh, and we see uh, a lot of value still in equity markets, including uh, uh, the Asian equity markets. Now, in particular, uh, given what I've already said about an improving cycle uh, globally, uh, we think that the value is currently in the cyclical sectors. Uh, those cyclical sectors look cheap. Uh, the defensive sectors look relatively expensive. So we would argue it's time to make a rotation out of the defensive into the cyclicals, including uh, in markets like India uh, in Asia. So, Philip, it would be safe to assume that within India right now, you are looking at the cyclical space, which is something you re reiterated in October as well. So that portfolio with the HSBC remains firm. Uh, how is India looking to you right now? You talked about the valuation picture. We're no longer a screaming buy. With a 23-25% uptake coming in last year in dollar terms, at least, India is no longer uh, the valued preference uh, in the Asia pack. And now with China seeing such a massive recovery in the economy side, uh, do you think India is going to lose its pole position that it saw with the $23 billion that came in last year? Do you think uh, that could continue this year? Or it's really going to fight hard for its return? Well, certainly the, the, the market uh, did remarkably well given the, the problems and the concerns uh, last year. Um, but if we look at valuations now currently on, on a forward PE basis, they're broadly in line with the five-year average. Uh, on a price-to-book basis, a trailing price-to-book basis, they are uh, slightly cheap to that five-year average. So uh, the, there's no screaming value overall for the market uh, anymore. But I think the issue is the anomaly really uh, in the sense that cyclicals look cheap and defensives look expensive. So we still see quite a lot of value uh, in those cyclical sectors, in consumer discretionary, uh, in materials, for example, in the industrials, whereas we think things like uh, health care or consumer staples look quite expensive. Uh, and so our, our focus would be on looking at the cheaper uh, stocks and the cheaper sectors in the market, uh, rather than, if you like, buying the, the, the market overall. Philip, in the past you have reiterated your concern on what the rupee is doing. Uh, it sort of got stuck in that range between uh, 53 to 56. If I had to go purely by the purchasing power parity index that the IMF tracks at this point, is the rupee still looking undervalued to you? Yes, it is. I, I think uh, the rupee is actually one of the currencies uh, that looks particularly undervalued on, on a PPP basis, certainly. Um, it's interesting, though, that uh, some of the reform steps that we've seen, uh, a, better, um, a better view really that, that foreign investors in particular have taken about inflation prospects. I think you know, this has helped uh, the currency and we've seen certainly an improvement in the flows. Uh, we've, I, I think, seeing uh, some expectation that the current account deficit, which of course is very high, will start to come down. So, in fact, uh, INR has really been probably the standout currency in Asia in the last uh, several weeks in terms of the way it's performed. 
Uh, and that's important because for a foreign investor in particular, uh, a large part, of course, of your prospective return in, in markets uh, that are denominated in somebody else's currency will relate to those currency moves. So I, I think that, um, uh, you know, while the currency was particularly weak uh, in part uh, of, of 2012, uh, the prospect now really is that the, the undervaluation will start to be eroded. But it's still undervalued uh, on, on most measures. Philip, uh, you've seen the Finance Ministry act uh, quite aggressively. The Finance Ministry go ahead and saying that we will do everything to tackle the growth problem. Fiscal prudence has become the mantra. We've heard of the last 48 hours with the Finance Minister this morning speaking to Bloomberg as well. The Finance Minister reiterating 5.3%. The other man who doesn't have it as easy right now is Dr. D. Subarao who almost has a commitment to the market at this point to go ahead and cut rates, but he's been stringent to say, I'm going to put the focus on inflation. Do you think that is the right path for the RBI to take, and how do you think this will actually pan out for India? Uh, what is your outlook for the fiscal as well as the monetary policy for the country? Well, I think uh, my view all through 2012 was that it was too early uh, to cut interest rates until that inflation battle had been won. I think the good news is that uh, there's evidence that inflation which of course has been extremely sticky, is starting to come down. And I think um, uh, my, my personal view is that we'll see more progress on inflation in the coming months. Now, whether they cut at next week's uh, meeting or not, I think there will be a cut uh, in, the coming cup, uh, in the coming three months, let's put it that way. So I think one way or another we will see uh, looser policy. Uh, it doesn't matter to me too much whether that's next week. I think it's much better for for the central bank to, to consolidate, if you like, uh, the view that inflation, the inflation battle is being won. Uh, I think that what they've done so far is correct in, in not, uh, if you like, not cutting prematurely. Uh, but I do think there is scope to cut now. And it's interesting that uh, it's one of the markets in the emerging world where we do see scope for uh, easier policy in the coming months. Whereas in most of these emerging economies now, we see central banks on hold. Uh, and in some of them, uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, the market is now pricing in higher uh, interest rates in the course of 2013. So uh, India, in that respect, is well set, as it were, for easier policy. But uh, I think it would, again, uh, to reiterate, be a mistake uh, for the central bank to ease if they really didn't think that they'd got that inflation problem under control. A lot of credit going to Dr. Z. Subarao from your end, Philip. Uh, would you accredit the same to the finance minister who's really turned it around over the last uh, six months for India? Uh, how crucial is the budget going in this year, uh, in other words, one month from now? And more importantly, are you more concerned about the elections that come up in 2014? Well, I think the election is clearly in 2014 is a critical issue, and it's one of the complications, uh, in a sense, for 2013. Um, budgetary policy, obviously the targets have been missed in the past. Uh, there is a question mark clearly about the ability to, to hit those targets in 2013 uh, given the election. Um, but, but I think uh, what we're seeing more generally uh, from the government, not just the finance ministry, is a, is a more realistic approach to, uh, to policy taking. Um, and so I'm, I'm encouraged overall by uh, by the, the rhetoric, certainly, by some of the moves that we've seen, um, uh, particularly in terms of uh, moves that will help to reduce not just the, the fiscal deficit, but the current account deficit as well. That, that's a, 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 twi it's a twin deficit problem, really, that, that India faces. Um, and so I'm, I'm encouraged by that, but the key challenge here is implementation. I mean, that's, you know, and that's not going to be straightforward given the political pressures of... Uh, of an election on the horizon in 2014. So I think the jury is still out. We, you know, we'd obviously hope to see progress there, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it would have been a lot easier to have made more of that progress in 2012, in my opinion, uh, than in a, in a pre-election year of uh, 2013. Philip, from the macros to the micros, uh, you talked about the valuation this country is offering at this point, uh, but the big question is investment cycle has still not picked up in India. How do you see the earnings cycle uh, move from here, not just in India but across Asia as well? Do you think the pace of downgrades, downgrades will slow down or is uh, the downgrade cycle completely over but we'll have to wait a while before the upgrades begin? 
Yeah, I, I think, I mean, clearly there's been a significant downgrading of, of earnings expectations actually across all equity markets pretty much, not just India, not just uh, emerging Asia. So uh, we've, we, we now have much more reasonable expectations, I would say. Uh, and in fact, in some of the Asian markets, uh, our view is that we can see uh, earnings expectations being beaten in 2013 uh, because they have come down a, a, a long way. Um, I think it will depend very much on um, how, how the macro story plays out. My expectation would be that uh, the growth in India will be picking up, top line uh, GDP growth will be picking up in 2013, uh, maybe a percentage ho higher than, than in, in 2012. So, you know, that should help in that environment. Uh, if inflation is coming under control, if commodity prices uh, 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 come more under control, or less problematic, let's say, uh, then that creates uh, a little bit of room for some, uh, some margin expansion which should be supportive uh, of earnings. So I think on balance I'd be relatively uh, positive that uh, we've got a much uh, more realistic base of expectations coming into 2013, than certainly than we had coming into 2012. And on that basis, yes, we might well start to see uh, a, a bit of an improvement in, in the picture, depending overall on how the macro, uh, underlying macro story plays out. All right, Philip, uh, thanks for joining us and taking, us, uh, taking out the time to share your views with us today. Thank you very much.